Hello and welcome back for week five of virtual learning. Um, this is considered week 33 on Connect. So if you're looking for this week's vocabulary and assignments, it's going to be week 33, which says April 20th through April 22nd. Um, <clears throat> before I start with this week's outline, um, yesterday, today is Sunday, yesterday our governor of Florida announced that we would be doing virtual school for the remainder of the year. Um, this is for our safety and our health, so I totally understand, um, but I really, really miss you guys. I really wanted to finish out the year with you. Um, we're still going to finish it out together, but just to get those hugs on the last day of school was something I was really looking forward to. But what we have to look forward to is when we see each other again in person. Um, and whether that be during the summer or when school starts back again in the fall and your fourth graders. Um, Please remember that I love you so, so much, and I only want the best for you, and I want you to be so successful in your education. Um, yeah, it's a little weird, pretty sad, but I know it's for the best, and I'm really thankful for Zoom. Super thankful for Zoom and Dojo. I'm getting a lot of you guys messaging me and just telling me what's going on with you. I love that. Um, please keep messaging me if you have any questions about assignments or um, even if you just need help with things, lessons on iReady, anything like that, send me a message on Dojo. If you want to do a one-on-one -on -one Zoom session, I've been doing those every week with students and it's been really nice to get to see you guys and talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I hope you're safe and healthy, and I'm going to go ahead and start with this week. So this week we are going to be reading chapters 21 through 30. This is the second to the last week. Next week we will finish How to Eat Fried Worms, and then you will be able to take an AR test on it. We will also have a project for this book, and I will be uploading that into next week's next week's Connect, um, and you'll have a few weeks to complete that. It'll be a tic-tac-toe choice board, so you'll have a few options of things that you can choose from to do as your project. Um, I'm going to go ahead with our vocabulary. This week's vocabulary, we've got 10 words again. Our first word is drippings. Drippings um, is the fat that melted from a roasted meat, so it's that juice that comes off of a roasted meat. Those are drippings. Our second vocabulary word is midst. If you're in the midst of something, you're in the middle, and they sound really similar, so that's kind of easy to remember. In the midst means you're in the middle of something. Our third vocabulary word is protrude. I'm pretty sure we had this vocabulary word a few weeks ago, maybe with the chocolate touch or maybe one of our journeys books, but protrude. It means to stick out. Um, if your eye is protruding, it might be a little bit swollen and st sticking out. Our fourth vocabulary word is bloat. Bloat means to become swollen and full. I think about Thanksgiving or any holiday with lots of good foods. You become very bloated and full. You're swollen in your stomach area. Our fifth vocabulary word is doubtful. If you're doubtful, you're feeling uncertain or unsure. If you didn't really study for a test and then you've got it the next day, you might be feeling a little doubtful about how well you'll do. Our sixth vocabulary word is slid. When um, someone slid down something, it means to quickly and smoothly move across a surface. This one's easy to remember because it looks just like slide without the E. So it's moving quickly and smoothly across a surface. Our seventh vocabulary word is slump. If you slump, it means to sit limply or to fall heavily over. You might slump down in your chair if you're really tired. Our eighth vocabulary word is scuttle. Scuttle is a quick shuffling run. Every time I hear this word, I think of Templeton. Um, just scuttling across the barnyard floor, um, trying to get to his little hole with all his food and scraps and stuff. So when you scuttle, it's a quick shuffling run. 
Our ninth vocabulary word is repetition. Repetition is the act of saying or doing something again and again. Think about the word repeat. Repetition, repeat. It's when you're saying something over and over again. And our tenth vocabulary word is furtive. Furtive means to do something in a sneaky way that tries to avoid attention and trouble. Maybe you pictured Templeton again. I don't know why I'm thinking of Templeton. I need to reread Charlotte's Web. But Templeton was very furtive. He did things furtively. He was very sneaky, trying to avoid attention and trouble. Those are our 10 vocabulary words. This week you have one mandatory classwork assignment again. It's the How to Eat Fried Worms classwork but you've got three others that are optional. You can do them and they would be really helpful to your grade, extra credit. It's the vocabulary study, the grammar classwork, and the writing classwork. There are some fun um, topics this week. Not as many as last week, but still some fun topics. Next week's topics are really fun. Um, your homework is going to be two past iReady lessons. Please make sure you're doing this. It's really, really good practice for you to continue to prepare you for fourth grade. Our um, assessments for this week, you actually have two this week for reading. The first one is the comprehension questions for how to eat fried worms. Please remember, watch my video while you're doing it or pull up the electronic copy while you're doing it. I do not expect you to memorize all of those answers. Use your text like you would on a standards mastery or any other reading assignment. Going back in the text is really the best thing. And if you don't have the copy, the electronic copy is on Connect. And you also have a study island assignment this week. I know, Miss Miller, study island. Usually don't put study island assignments up, but we needed kind of a standards mastery, but we've done all the standards masteries on iReady. So you do have a study island assignment. It's called study island week 33. You're going to have from Monday to Sunday to complete that. Um, I think it is down to 20 questions. So it's only 20 questions. I tried to keep the passages really short and um short and simple, but that covered the standards that we've been reviewing. Now remember, these aren't new standards. This isn't new stuff. We've already covered all of these skills at least twice. Um, so some things you'll see on there are characters, um, theme, you'll see comparing and contrasting, um, some things like that. We'll have a language study island assignment in a few weeks. Um, but this week is just reading skills. There's a little informational, a little fiction. Um, so it's a blend, but only 20 questions. Try to keep them really short and use the same passages so you weren't having to read too much. Those are the two assignments that you need to do. Um, also make sure that you are doing the daily attendance. Remember, you only have to do that for your homeroom teacher. So if you're in Ms. Dubosk's homeroom, you don't have to do it for me, just for her. Um, and also the art and the PE Participation surveys are part of your grade as well for art and PE. The other assignments from any other resource classes, skills, media, tech, those are all optional, but they are really good practice and fun things to do if you've got extra time. Whew, I think I covered everything. Okay, we're going to go ahead and jump into How to Eat Fried Worms. This week we're reading chapters 21 through 30. Now before I start, I want to preface or um, begin by telling you that there is a chapter in this book that has inappropriate language. Um, normally, if we were in class, I might read that word because we could have a discussion about it. But because we're not in class, I'm going to replace that word with another word. Remember, these are boys that are young. Um, I think they're like 12 years old. So sometimes they use inappropriate language, things that we would not repeat. We would not say those words um, other than when we're reading them. But because this is uh, an educational video, I am going to just replace that word. Um, just because we can't have a discussion face to face about it. Alrighty, I'm gonna go ahead with how to eat fried worms. Chapter 21. When we left off, Billy's mom had agreed to do um, give the worms to Billy. She had agreed to be kind of the referee for them. <clears throat> Chapter 21, the tenth worm. What's for dinner, said Billy's father, coming into the kitchen. 
Well, said Billy's mother, you and I and Emily are having hamburgers and string beans and mashed potatoes. Billy is having a fried worm. More worms? The bed's still on? Look, she took a small plate covered with saran wrap out of the refrigerator. And you've eaten nine of these already, Billy? He poked the worms curiously. What do you do? Use a lot of ketchup and mustard? Billy nodded. And horseradish and other things. And we fry them. Billy's father lifted a corner of the saran wrap and smelled the worms. Helen, you ought to be able to do better than fried. Use your cookbooks. I'm not the cook. I'm the referee. Oh, come on. Think of the challenge. He took a cookbook from the shelf under the spice rack. Let's see. Mastering the art of French cooking. He leafed through the cookbook. Here, how about poached eels on toast? No, said Billy's mother. It calls for chopping up the eel in little pieces, and that would be against the rules. How about spaghetti with worm balls, then? Or a savory worm pie? Creamed worms on toast? Spanish worm? Worm loaf with mushroom sauce? Wait, said Billy's mother, putting down her cooking spoon. It might just... She took the cookbook and turned to the index. Here, she read, Alsatian smothered worm. Dredge the worm with seasoned flour. Saute in three tablespoons drippings until brown. Cover with sliced onions. Pour over one cup thick sour cream. Cover pot closely and bake in a slow oven until tender. Bravo, said Billy's father. Put the hamburgers back in the refrigerator. We'll all have worm tonight. I won't, said Emily. Ha, huh, said Billy, grinning in the midst of chewing. Boy, Alan and Joe thought they were doing me in when they came to you. Mom, but this is better than steak. It really tastes good. Ugh, muttered Emily, making a face. Let me have a taste, said Billy's father. No, no, said his mother. Billy has to eat every bit himself. Alan and Joe were very firm about that, and I'm the referee. Boy, said Billy, I don't mind if it tastes like this. Chapter 22, The Eleventh Worm I like how Billy's mom is being fair, but making it as fun as she can. She's not cheating, I don't think. <clears throat> How'd you do it, said Billy. What's it called? My word, said his father. Gosh, Mrs. Forrester, gasped Tom. On a silver dish in front of Billy lay an ice cream cake bathed in fruit syrups, peach, cherry, tutti-frutti, candied orange, topped with whipped cream, sprinkled with jelly beans and almond slivers. It's called a whiz-bang worm delight, said Billy's mother proudly. I made it up. Is the worm really in there? said Billy, poking about with his spoon. And then, scraping away a bit of whipped cream at one end, he glimpsed the worm's snout protruding from the center of the cake. Snug as a bug in a rug, said his mother. <clears throat> I still wouldn't eat a worm, said Emily, eyeing the whiz-bang worm delight with envious distaste. I would, said Tom. At least, maybe I would. Chapter 23 Admirals Nagumo and Kusaka on the bridge of the Aikaiga, December 6, 1941. <clears throat> it won't work. Look, said Joe, even if he remembers the worm while we're at Shea, he can't get one. Where is anyone going to find a worm at Shea Stadium? Don't worry, we'll say. You've won. <clears throat> we'll find a worm after we get home. And we keep right on stuffing him. Peanuts, hot dogs, hamburgers, Cracker Jack, ice cream, orange soda, gum, Mars bars. You know how he loves to eat. You ever seen him refuse something to eat? By the time we start home, he'll be bloated, drowsy, belching. Remember the last time when his father took us? He was asleep by the time we hit Peekskill. Your father will carry him in from the car. His mother and father will put him to bed. 
Next morning he'll wake up. Too late. You've won. Fifteen worms in fifteen days. He missed a day. Alan gnawed at his thumbnail. What about Tom? We'll ask him along and then just not pick him up. We can tell your father and Billy that Tom's mother called. He was sick. His grandmother died. Anything. Just so we don't have to bring him with us. Alan sighed. Jeez, it'll probably cost me eight dollars just to buy all that food. Cracker Jack, hamburgers. Yeah, but it'll cost you fifty dollars if he wins. Yeah, well... Oh, jeez, how did I ever get into this? If my father finds out... Alan slumped on the porch steps, gazing down at his sneakers, gnawing his thumbnail. Come on, said Joe, slapping him on the shoulder. Cheer up! You haven't lost yet. Go ask your father. Chapter 24, The Twelfth Form You think Alan really meant it when he said he'd given up? Asked Billy, turning down the flame under the frying pan. He was cooking a toasted cheese and worm sandwich. I don't know, said Tom, looking in the refrigerator. I suppose so. He asked us to the Mets game. Say, is that chocolate pudding? Yeah, but don't take any. It's for supper. I could just scrape some off the top, and then you could tell your mother it fell out upside down on the floor by mistake while you were getting the cheese out. So you scrape the dirty part off into the garbage. Well, said Billy doubtfully. Thomas Grout, said Billy's mother, coming in from the hall. I'm surprised at you. Aw, Mrs. Forrester, I wouldn't really have done it. I was just, you know, talking. Everybody talks. My father, Billy's father, Billy. My sister's Annie, Charlotte, Polly. He was backing toward the door. Betty, Agnes, Columbus. I didn't know you had a sister named Columbus, Tom, said Billy's mother. Would you like some chocolate ice cream instead? Oh, sure, Mrs. Forrester, said Tom, relieved. He sat down at the table. It's my cousin who's named Columbus, he grinned. Columbus, Ohio. He's a capital fellow, Mrs. Forrester. <laughs> and then he had to grab the edge of the table to keep from rolling off his chair laughing at his own joke. Billy looked disgusted. His mother opened the refrigerator, shaking her head. Chapter 25, Pearl Harbor. The car slid quietly to a stop under the street light outside Billy's house. Shh, whispered Alan to his father. Billy's asleep. His father glanced back at Billy, snoring peacefully in the back seat, his plump cheeks sticky with orange soda. Alan. Run up to the house and tell them I'm bringing Billy in. Billy's father met them at the front door and, taking Billy, whispered his thanks. Alan and his father went to walk, went down the walk. Behind them, the porch light clicked off. In the back seat of the car, Joe and Alan wrestled gleefully. We did it! We've won! You'll never wake up now! Alan struggled out of Joe's grip and asked his father what time it was. Late. Almost midnight, I think. Joe pulled Alan's head down and tried to sit on it. He couldn't do it now, even if he woke up. He could. How could he find and cook and eat a worm in the dark? <laughs> We've won. We've won. Hmm. So I guess their plan went as planned. Chapter twenty-six. Guadalcanal. But slumped on the bathroom stool, his mother holding up his chin while she washed his face, Billy was waking. Hold still, dear. Did you have a good time? You're certainly home late. Is this part of winning the bet? Billy's eyes blinked sleepily. He had a gnawing feeling he had forgotten something. He hiccuped, gazing dopily down at the fuzzy blue bath mat. Yawned. Oh, he'd remember in the morning. It couldn't be that him. Bet! Bet! He hadn't won yet. There were still three to go. Fifteen. Fifteen worms in fifteen days. Today was... He jumped up. Mom, I haven't eaten my worm today. And suddenly it all came to him. The whole trip. All the candy bars, hot dogs, hamburgers, popcorn. What time is it, Mom? Quick! About a quarter to twelve. It was a trick. He snatched his pants off the floor. They 
were trying to make me forget. He tumbled and slid downstairs through the dining room, his shirt tail flying, yanked open the drawer in the kitchen table, snatched out the flashlight, the drawer spilling out with a clatter and crash on the floor, and slammed out the back door. The Finks! He scuttled across the backfield toward Tom's house, searching the ground with the flashlight as he went. There! Darn, a stick. Jeez, suppose I can't find one. He stopped. There won't be time to cook it. He ran on. And no ketchup. He stopped. I'll bet Tom wasn't sick at all. He ran on. The night was moonless and close. He paused to heave over a rotten log in the high, dewy grass, mealy bugs and scooters, clambered over the stone wall into Tom's backyard, and was all of a sudden wrestling with a pup tent. Muffled grunts and thrashings. Tom! he yelled. Tom! It's me! Billy! They're trying to trick us! Tom and his younger brother, Pete, crawled out from under the pup tent. It was a trick, panted Billy. Alan and Joe were trying to make me forget. Fifteen worms in fifteen days. If I don't eat one in the next ten minutes, Alan will say he's won. It's almost midnight. And they left me home so I wouldn't remind you? Billy nodded. Have you got a worm? We'll have to find one. Tom dug back into the pup tent and came up with two flashlights. They zigzagged back and forth across the lawn, bent over, searching. I got one, cried Pete. Shh, I'll have to eat it raw, said Billy. He threw back his head. Wait, whispered Tom, grabbing his arm. You should do it where Alan and Joe can see you. Pete, run and get your siren out of the garage. Chapter 27, The Thirteenth Worm Under the streetlight in front of Alan's house, Tom and Pete knelt over the siren. Billy stood beside them, the nightcrawler squirming in his fingers. Now wait till lots of lights come on all over in all the houses, said Tom. Then chomp it down. Ready, Pete? Now. The siren growled, winding slowly up and up until it screeched across the sleeping neighborhood, sending birds squawking and chirping into the air from trees and rooftops, Dogs began to bark. Windows lit up. There were confused shouts, bangs of windows slamming up. Ladies and gentlemen, shouted Tom through the dying whine of the siren. Alan Phelps and Joseph O'Hara through their thinkness and cheating, their lies and dirty. Come on, muttered Billy, his head thrown back, dangling the worm over his open mouth. We haven't got much time. Alan Phelps and Joseph O'Hara, shouted Tom, have forced us to wake you all up so that you may now witness. Ta-ra-ta-ta, ta-ra-ta-ta, ta-ra-ta-ta. The eating of the 13th worm. He dropped to his knees. The siren wound slowly up to a screech. Billy dropped the crawler into his mouth, chewed furiously, his eyes closed, fell to his knees, still chewing, his face turning beet red, toppled over on his side, still chewing, rolled and writhed about the sidewalk, clutching his stomach, still chewing, Tom and Pete kneeling by the streetlight, working the screaming siren. Billy threw open his arms and lay still on his back under the glare of the streetlight, his mouth wide open. Tara announced Tom, springing up and pointing to Billy. The three boys ran off into the darkness. As they went, Tom yelled, Remember, Alan Phelps and Joseph O'Hara. <laughs> Guess the plane didn't work. Chapter 28. Hello, we're dot, dot, dot. A confused murmur arose up and down the street. Suddenly, a boy shouted from the Phelps house. Thanks! Alan's father dragged him back from the window. Is that why you were stuffing Billy with candy and junk all day? Leave me alone. Yeah, we were trying to trick him. The Fink! Thanks! 
he yelled at the top of his voice, lunging toward the window. Quiet! His father sat him down hard in a chair. Joe peered furtively out through the fringe of the bedspread. As soon as he had heard the siren and Tom's yells, he had crawled under the bed. And that's why Billy woke the whole neighborhood up? To show you he hadn't been tricked? Yes. His father let go of Alan's pajama collar. In the doorway, Alan's mother threw up her hands and went off to the bathroom to take two aspirin. The next day, Alan and Joe tramped from house to house in the neighborhood, knocking on each door and then reciting in chorus. Hello, we're Alan Phelps and Joseph O'Hara. We're the reason you were waked up in the middle of the night last night, and we're sorry. You'll be happy to know our parents have punished us. We can't look at television or have any dessert for a month, and our allowances have been taken away for two weeks. We promise that this will never happen again. At least not in this neighborhood, muttered Joe as the last door closed behind them. And Alan, said his father at di dinner that night, I don't want to hear that there has been any repetition of this incident at Billy's or Tom's house or anywhere else. Do you understand that? But we can't let them get away with it, Mr. Phelps, called Joe from the living room where he was waiting for Alan to finish dinner. There will be no repetition of this incident or anything like it, repeated Mr. Phelps. You tried to trick Billy and lost. That will be the end of the matter. Chapter 29. Blob. You know what you are, said Alan, his nose almost touching Billy's. You're a jerk. And you're another, sneered Billy through clenched teeth. And a cheating, lying, dirty, snot-nosed, cheating, lying one. If you say two more words, said Alan, you know what? I'll beat your head in. Billy breathed hard. I'm right behind you, muttered Tom, peering grimly over Billy's shoulder, his finch clenched. Yeah, said Joe from behind Alan. So what? We can lick both of you with our hands tied behind our backs and paper bags over our heads. You couldn't lick a flea. Yeah? Yeah. Spiffle. Whack. Thump. Someone's choking. No fair. Uh-oh. Not good. Thwomp. Gouge. Joe crawled off behind a tree, nose bleeding. Whomp! He's pulling hair! He's scratching! Twist! Twist! Alan crawled, weeping behind a bush. Thunk! Whack! Thunk! Billy, it's just you and me. Where are the others? Tom and Billy untangled and sat up, bruised, scratched, dusty, shirts torn, hair tussled. Tom's nose was bleeding. Billy's shoe had come off. Yeah, yeah, sassed Alan and Joe from behind the tree. Billy started to shake his fist at them and clamber up, but then sank back. Tom panted beside him, bleary-eyed. Yeah, yeah, all worn out, can't fight any more. Alan scooped up a handful of mud and flung it at Tom and Billy. Then Joe did the same. Billy and Tom scrambled up and pelted back. Mud splattered against trees and bushes. Alan began to cry. A rock hit Billy over the eye. He sat down backward in the mud, covering his head with his arms, sobbing. Joe and Tom stopped throwing. Joe grabbed Alan. Come on. Tom knelt beside Billy. Let me see, Billy. Is it bad? Take your arms away so I can see. He tried to pull Billy's arms apart. Billy wrenched away. Come on, said Tom in a scared voice. I'll take you home. Come on, your mother can take you to the doctor. Chapter 30. Chapter 30, The Peace Treaty. Alan and Joe sat on the sofa, Tom and Billy on two straight chairs opposite them. Now, said Alan's father, what's this all about? The four boys all began talking at once, accusing, recounting, explaining. All right, said Alan's father after a while. That's enough. Now, we know it's got something to do with this bet Alan and Billy made, but Mr. O'Hara and I aren't going to get involved in that. You'll have to settle that among yourselves. You four boys have been friends for too long to start fighting now, said Mr. O'Hara. You really hurt each other. Look at yourselves. Your faces all bruised and muddy. Talk it over. 
work things out, and then you can shake and be friends again. Joe muttered under, under his breath. I couldn't be friends with those rats. We'll be out in the kitchen, said Alan's father. When you've settled it, call us, and we'll all go down to Friendly's for some ice cream, okay? Billy and Alan and Tom nodded. The two fathers left the room. The boys gazed silently at each other. After a while, Alan said, It wasn't us that scratched Tom. Billy did it. Another silence. Did you have stitches? Billy asked Alan. Nah. Did you? Billy shook his head. More silence. You tried to cheat, said Billy. That wasn't cheating. We were just trying to trick you. Yeah, but before that, when you glued the two worms together, that was cheating. You would have cheated too if you'd been losing. Billy thought about it. Okay, but look, no more cheating. I've already eaten 13 worms. You know I can eat two more. Heck, if I can buy George Cunningham's brother's mini bike, we can all use it. We'll all have fun with it. Joe and Alan glanced at each other. Okay, said Joe. You win. He wins, Alan. Yeah, but... What's the use, said Joe. We've tried everything. I'm sick of it. Jeez, we've done nothing else for almost two weeks. Alan scratched his eyebrow, glancing at Joe. Yeah, but... Joe stood up. Come on. At least we'll get a milkshake out of it. And that is it for this week. Interesting turn of events. Hmm, wonder what's going to happen next. Remember, if you have any questions about your weekly assignments or about anything in the book or any vocabulary words, you can join me on Zoom. I'll be on from 8 to 9 on Monday and 12.45 to 1.45 on Friday. And you can message me anytime on Dojo. If we need to do a one-on-one -on -one session, we can. I will talk to you all soon, and I hope to see you this week at some point on Zoom.